Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rob Bennett. I'm the CEO and founder of EcoDistricts, and welcome to another installment of our webinar series. Um, really pleased to have you uh, with us. We're going to take a minute, let people settle in, and as people are settling in, um, I'll provide a little bit of an oversight of how the webinar is going to work, and then introduce our speaker today. Um, really excited uh, to be talking about a project in our home city. We've done so many webinars, um, you know, uh, uncovering great projects and talking to leading practitioners from all over the country. But today we get to, to talk to Anule Halavo, um, who is a, the founder of a new development company. We're going to get into this in a moment. Um, but uh, it's always really nice to hear what's going on uh, in the city of Portland, where uh, our organization was founded. Uh, just for some homework, or some sorry, some uh, back of house, um, we are, for, as many of you know, in the, uh, when we do these webinars, um, we want to make it as inclusive and um, and uh, dialogue driven as possible. So um, Anule is going to be presenting for about uh, 35 to 40 minutes, and then we have time for Q and A. So do use your Q and A function here on the Zoom webinar. Uh, we're getting pretty familiar with how this works, but feel free to type your questions as she's talking. Um, I'll do my best to, to look at those questions, curate them, and then ask her um, as many questions as we can get to during the Q&A. This webinar is being recorded um, and will be uh, uploaded to our information exchange uh, uh, in the next few days. So you'll be able to, to look at it. Um, if you like what you're seeing, feel free to uh, pass the link along to colleagues that aren't able to make it. We know uh, spring is in the air, summer is here, and people are uh, moving away from as much digital learning uh, as possible given we've been inundated. Uh, but we're really, really excited to continue this series because it's a great opportunity to, uh, to build our community uh, and to learn from one another. Um, we have been doing this uh, webinar series for, for a couple of years and uh, really pleased that um, we have uh, support from uh, some key funders, uh, including um, including the Bullet Foundation, um, uh, the Kresge Foundation, Rethink, and um, and Anale's company, uh, Audrey, as well today. Um, so let me introduce Anale. She's uh, a terrific, powerful developer here in Portland. She's been practicing uh, pra practicing development and design for 17 years. Um, and she's been involved in some of the region's most sort of iconic and important projects. Um, prior to founding her company, which she's going to talk about, uh, to focus in on Black home ownership and uh, really working on developing housing uh, and projects uh, for those who haven't had access and who haven't had the ability to build uh, capital and wealth uh, as quickly. She was with Project for 12 years, and prior to that, Gerding Edlin uh, and EDA, which is now AECOM. So she has spent her career uh, working at the intersections of real estate and design, uh, land conservation, housing policy, um, and is in a really great position to talk about uh, urbanism, uh, the sort of uh, the key challenges that the development industry faces, how to overcome and integrate equity and equitable development into our work. And that's what this project, uh, the Meyer Memorial Headquarters project is gonna talk about. And, and Anale is gonna dive into that project and how that has can have a, a really important net positive effect on uh, how to advance equitable and sustainable development, uh, one project at a time. Um, and she's been involved in a lot of civic work as well here, not just in, in doing real estate development that includes civic projects, student housing, large scale master development projects, commercial development, retail. Um, but she's also uh, a governor's appoint, uh, appointee as vice chair on the Oregon Land Conservation and Development Commission that oversees all of our land use planning in Oregon, which is arguably one of the most sophisticated land use planning uh, uh, policy um, uh, uh, policies in the country. Um, she's been involved um, as a mayoral appointment here in Portland for a lot of our what we call our Portland plan and comp plan work of the last five or so years where we've taken a very close look and re um, established new goals and, and objectives and refreshed our comprehensive and, uh, and urban design planning in the city. And she's currently on the U.S. Green Building Council, so is very active in the, in the green building space as well. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Anile and uh, kick off our uh, webinar for today.
Thank you, Rob. I just want to, I'm going to share my screen. I think you have to unshare. And I can, I'll start. Nice. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> um, I'm here to talk today about a project that I uh, completed uh, in my last uh, partnership that I was in. And it's a project for Meyer Memorial Trust. That's a, one of Oregon's uh, largest foundations. And I'm, I'm here to talk about centering equity in a building project and really thinking about equity um, kind of on the, the project level. And as, as discussed uh, in the questions and answers, we might talk about kind of more regional and policy wise um, uh, as, as kind of an offshoot of this. So the outline for today is, you know, I'm gonna talk about Meyer, the sustainability goals for the project, equity goals. Um, I'm gonna take you on a tour of the project so you could see it and then talk about um, kind of a, almost like a different project, which was the storytelling and art uh, component of the project. And then kind of end, it, end this presentation with um, kind of lessons learned or things to think about, uh, especially if you're in this uh, space of uh, making buildings happen. So Meyer Memorial Trust uh, is one of Oregon's largest foundations. Uh, their, their, their kind of focus as, an, as a uh, foundation is about uh, dismantling barriers uh, to equity and improving uh, community conditions. And really the goal of their, their organization is that at the end of the day, there's a flourishing and equitable organ so that all Oregonians can reach their potential. And um, there's, a, there's a video that I'm gonna give a link at the end of the presentation that uh, kind of talks about the history of Oregon in context of this project for those that are not in Oregon to kind of get a sense on why creating an equitable organ is uh, super important. And so how do, how do they do this? They essentially give out uh, around $36 million a year uh, to four priority areas and um, building community is one of them, equitable education, housing opportunities and healthy environments. So if you're in the affordable housing space, you know Meyer uh, because they are pretty much fund or help fund almost all of the affordable housing projects uh, in town uh, and, and in the state. Um, and then, uh, you know, thinking on the environmental side, uh, they're, they're big uh, funders of kind of uh, reclamation and environmental um, justice uh, initiatives uh, in the state. And so an example of an initiative that they just launched was uh, Justice Oregon for Black Lives that they launched last year, which is a five year, $25 million commitment, um, which is the largest initiative in, in their history and, and really um, what Meyer, the role that Meyer plays in the state of Oregon is really shaping the way that organizations, especially the ones that get funded through them, think about equity and who they're serving um, and ensuring that uh, there's an equity lens to everything that they do. So what was uh, really great about this project is it allowed Meyer the opportunity, oops, sorry about that. It allowed Meyer the opportunity to um, go through a building process that, uh, and, and see kind of what are those trade-offs that are made through that process that hopefully will affect the way that they think about uh, how they give uh, toward development projects. So that I think that, that was a benefit uh, to them. So, you know, the Meyer project I would say is very unique. I mean, you almost couldn't have foreseen how unique it would be until you, you see this picture, which is, you know, the CEO of Meyers on the left, um, the chair of the board, um, myself, uh, the architect and the contractor are in this picture. And considering the history of Oregon, uh, which is essentially wa wanted to be a, a white utopia or a racially exclusive uh, state, um, there's a lot of um, harsh realities and histories associated with uh, the ability for, for Black folks, folks uh, Indigenous folks to kind of uh, prosper within this context. And so I, I think uh, just showing the leadership of this team, I think uh, shows how, how different this project is and, and uh, what resulted was, was a different type of project. And so, uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, the idea was that this is obviously a mission driven project considering it was the home for Meyer. Uh, they had been renting office space in um, the Pearl District, which is a, a district in Portland, downtown Portland. Uh, you would have to, you know, go through a lobby, go up an elevator, go to the third floor, touch a button <laughs> before you could interact with them. So there's a lot of barriers, let's say, for interact with them. And 
they wanted um, their kind of values as an organization with this openness to the community uh, to reflect in actually the building that they inhabited. So uh, they hired Project. Um, I used to be a partner at a company called Project, and they hired us to um, essentially find them a new home. So we we looked at, we had a broker that we worked with, actually an African-American uh, commercial broker who helped us go around and, you know, identify properties throughout uh, the city. Access to transportation was uh, was super important. Um, we, we mapped out where all of their staff live. So being in good proximity to all of their staff. Uh, a lot of the organizations that they fund uh, are in the North, Northeast Portland. Um, so I think that had a draw as being, you know, close to the organizations they serve. Uh, they wanted to make sure that they weren't um, tearing down a community resource in any way of uh, whatever land that they picked. So um, we, lo we looked at this site, which was a former tow lot. And it was, it's kind of at the intersection of I-5, a highway that runs through here. And actually that highway was the highway that kind of tore in, in some ways in half the, the, the black community that, that historic black community that was uh, in this area called uh, Albina. And so um, there was a lot of public infrastructure that went into this area, including the highway um, and, and the, you know, Coliseum and stadium, you know, that went into destroying um, a historic black community. And so this was, was a tow yard kind of at that inter intersection and, and, and environmentally not that great, right? Because it had been storing all these cars for, for quite some years. And so the priority for this project was really about how do you prioritize equity uh, across the workforce that builds it, and then also this commitment to sustainability, which is core to, to their values. Okay, sorry, it's really touchy. Um, obviously, I'm one representative on a, a large team, and so Project was the essentially hired as the developer to give a, kind of a market rate approach to to the mission driven project, but you know, there's 13 design team members and 35 subcontractors that that um, were part of this goal of this project. So it, I'm going to start off with, you know, kind of what were the sustainability goals of the project? Uh, you know, we went through a bunch of different rating systems. What do we want to do? We decided we were going to go for lead. Um, and then we decided, you know, through a long process that we were going to go for for platinum and that's version four, which actually is the most rigorous uh, version of of the kind of series of lead certifications. Uh, we are we did path to net zero, which is you know essentially creating this you know a structure where eventually this could become a net zero building. And through this process and kind of jumping forward, we, we were able to get a 2020 um, FSC uh, Forest uh, Stewardship Council Leadership Award and uh, a U.S. Green Building Council um, Leadership Award. And you'll you'll get a sense more <laughs> why we got those two awards. But really, both of those awards were about kind of um, innovation on the wood building side for the FSC part. And then for the USGBC it was about, you know, matching sustainability goals with equity goals. So, you know, the, the building is fully, a full electric building. We put a uh, 53 kilowatt solar array on the roof. That was really important um, for Meyer to, to generate uh, electricity. Uh, and and at the end, I, I don't, this wasn't actually a goal of ours. It was sort of shocking. Like <laughs> at the end, we found out that um, we are performing in the top one percent uh, for energy performance among similar types. So I, I like doing all these things resulted in that, which I think is 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 important um, to the actual operations of the building because this is where Meyer plans to to own and be for a long time. Uh, and then we, you know, we're using thirty percent less carbon slash energy over a code building. And with the solar array, we're actually using 50% uh, less energy than a code building. We have on-site electrical vehicle charging. We're, we're monitoring the energy um, usage through, you can see on the bottom left-hand corner, kind of this chart that shows, you know, the usage versus how much production. Very fascinating. Uh, you could just sit there and look at that all day um, if you're in this industry, probably. Uh, and then the idea of low uh, carbon construction materials, which I'll go over more uh, with the wood building uh, goals. And then there were, you know, innovative, let me make sure I didn't pass up. Oh. So um, one, one of the interesting parts, I think, especially for our, the architects watching is the actual shape of the building 
was shaped in a way that met the sustainability and equity goals. I think a lot of times we think about that in terms of sustainability, but not necessarily in terms of equity, which I can describe how the, the shape of the building changed. Uh, but, you know, this kind of iconic roof line wasn't just, you know, a form <laughs> that looked pretty in some sense. It actually is the optimal uh, angle uh, for solar. So we actually mo modeled that to be optimal for solar. I'm having some issues with uh, forwarding my slides, so sorry, guys. Um, and then other innovative solutions regarding, um, you know, reducing the footprint for parking. Uh, the, if, the, if we wanted to do the amount of parking stalls that we ended up having, and we just did it as a surface lot, it would have taken up a lot of the site area, and we didn't want to do that environmentally and visually. So the idea of a car matrix that, you know, kind of shuffles the car, uh, cars kind of reduce that footprint, uh, you know, large bike amenities for commuters, uh, being next to the highway uh, was very important for the indoor air quality to, to be good. Um, and, and also when you're going for LEED version four rating, you kind of are going for everything <laughs> that you possibly can. So that led us to, you know, this uh, uh, outdoor, you know, intake of air, um, high filtration and carbon mon uh, CO2 monitoring. Uh, what we didn't know at the time when all of that was planned was that we were going to have forest fires and we didn't know we were gonna have COVID. And so what was great in thinking about a resilient building is that when the building was finished and we were like, how do we, do, you know, let's look at this and see if we can inhabit this for COVID purposes, we realized everything was done, it was good to go. And I, I think that says a lot. And then when the fires happened, uh, the indoor air quality um, was very good. And, and, and this is the reality of our future um, in a kind of changing, global landscape slash, uh, you know, kind of uh, climate change issues that we've been creating is we're going to have more of these type of events. We just don't know what they are. And do we have the buildings that are going to be able to respond to those type of events? So um, water usage, the idea of, you know, low flow fixtures and, you know, reducing it as much as possible um, is big. I think uh, in Oregon, even though we have so water, <laughs> uh, managing that water is very important, uh, is probably one of the most important things. So all of the, the site can retain all of the, the storm water uh, that, it, that comes on site. And then sort of the basis for the building, it's a wood building. And uh, I think it, that was important to Meyer um, from, from a variety of reasons. One is the idea of carbon sequestration and using a renewable resource and the amount of energy that goes into producing wood. Uh, versus, uh, you know, concrete or steel, but an, uh, specific to Oregon, really Meyer was committed through their wood, not just to just buy any wood, let's say, but, you know, to make sure that the wood was uh, supporting rural forestry based jobs, uh, rural communities, and then uh, also being innovative with regard to the materials that we were using. And so, um, this almost was like an exercise in and of itself, <laughs> separated from the rest of the project, where we uh, worked with Sustainable Northwest and Meyer to essentially def define a term for sustainable wood. And uh, that, that definition uh, basically supported forests that are managed intentionally for carbon sequestration, workers' rights, human health, water, and wildlife habitat. And so we created this definition separate from, let's say, some of the certification processes because there was a big desire to um, have equity play a role in this. So not to go to the extreme, you know, sustainability in, in, in kind of uh, not the benefit of, of our equity goals. And then also cost was in consideration, right? And so there's some product, wood products that you, you can't really get at a reasonable cost um, being FSC certified. But there's a whole bunch of other ones that you can get at a, at a good price. So managing the, those premiums with also the goals of sustainable wood. So the result of this was that 85% uh, of the, the wood in the building is was considered sustainable wood um, by Meyer, and 49% of this ended up being uh, FSC certified wood. And so we had a series of uh, criteria, like how are we going to decide what's sustainable or not? And it sort of was this green yellow, red light options. And the criteria for that was about prioritizing um, wood products that were fabricated locally, right? Or uh, Meyer serves Oregon, so being local was important. Uh, locally from rural communities, from tribal enterprises, and from minority women and emerging small businesses. Um, then the next criteria was uh, FSC certified wood. And uh, other wood like uh, from forest reforestation, um, recycled wood and urban salvage trees. We actually ended up salvaging some of the wood from the tow 
building that was there prior and using that for the benches in the, the plaza that you'll see. And then uh, really about pri prioritizing wood products from Oregon first, uh, Pacific North a second, and then North America third. And actually tracking and knowing where all of this wood was coming from uh, was a part of that process. And so that was done in conjunction with Sustainable Northwest, who is a nonprofit in, in Oregon and the, the contractor, and basically the team. So our wood package ended up being worth uh, $750,000, and we actually only had a 3% premium to kind of secure what we would call this 85% sustainable wood and to meet um, these minority and small business participation goals. Uh, that was carefully monitored because we didn't want to come out with a project that said, yeah, we did all these wonderful goals, and you're going to have to pay you know, a 50% premium if you want to replicate this. And so this was actually thought of in the sense of how can we create a system or a pathway that a market rate developer could come in and think, yeah, I'll spend a 3% premium to see this happen, right? Sort of like 5% or less we felt like was okay. Um, and so what this resulted in was uh, six minority contractors were involved in the wood package, uh, seven small businesses, uh, three products could actually be tracked to the forest of or origin, and all wood products uh, were so sourced in the Pacific Northwest uh, region. And, and then nine of the products were fabricated within 70 miles of the project supporting uh, local jobs. So um, being an organ based and focused foundation, uh, measuring that kind of 70 mile radius was really important. And so the whole, in the whole intent behind that was actually that, you know, Meyer understood what was going into their building, felt comfortable with what they were doing as an organization. But really, one of the things we wanted to do was to create a case study so that other people could learn from this. It's very hard, hard as a market rate developer to just suddenly decide to do something like this, right? So Myers Project can allow that to be easier. And so um, at the link at the end, you can actually have a link to this case study that talks about this in detail. What was great is some of the team members on our project, the architect, and Sustainable Northwest applied for a USDA Wood Innovations Grant this last round of funding and received it. And they're going to take this concept and actually make, make it into a database, a public, publicly accessible database of sustainable wood materials. So the idea is now as a developer, I can come to this database and essentially, or tell my contractor, use materials from this database that show this kind of environmental responsibility. But what's unique about what they've decided to do is to put that equity lens on it too, so that you can know that you're supporting minority and women owned businesses uh, through your selection of wood, making it infinitely easier for everybody else uh, who comes after us. And so, you know, three examples that are shown in the case study. One uh, is the minority uh, subcontractor that did the cabinets and casework and actually uh, got their FSC kind of certification through this process. So um, that has benefits to them. Uh, through this process. Uh, and then there's other examples like the cedar siding um, and the hardwood floors are, are an example of a family owned forest that uh, Xena Forest Conservation Easement and uh, folks that are really um, thinking about how they take care of their forest and, and regenerative forest uh, practices. So knowing that when you see the floor, you know, you can know where that uh, came from. And then kind of in this in wood innovations category, um, the, 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 I, I uh, in my role at Project and also um, the architect Lever um, have been kind of leaders in the mass timber movement uh, early on doing a project called the Framework Check, which was going to be uh, the first high rise, high rise made out of wood. And that project had cross laminated timber. Um, we're still, you know, thinking, doing uh, projects with cross laminated tim timber, but there are all sorts of wood innovations that are coming out. Um, specifically in Oregon, and one of them is mass plywood. And so it, it's essentially like a big piece of plywood is the best way to describe it. Um, it and so this part of the project was an innovation and also uh, supported uh, rural jobs. And so you get a sense of that kind of mass plywood product. And it's been used in other projects before, but never showcased uh, really, because it, it, a lot of people see it as a kind of industrial product that you kind of cover up. And we wanted to show that you can, this can be a really beautiful product and it could actually, the, the structure of the, the room, and this is actually, you'll see is going to be the center for great purposes. So the structure of the room, you don't have to cover it up. You can actually just show it, um, which reduced cost and also creates this uh, experience interfacing with wood, which uh, has, is kind of like this biophilia uh, experience. 
And so on, on our equity goals for this project, um, there were no requirements by any government body or <laughs> elsewhere that said that Meyer had to do anything in this regard. So what was great is it allowed us the freedom to say, what, what's the maximum we think we can do? What, what do we think is impactful for the industry? Um, let's all sit around and think about what that is. And so the contractor was very instrumental in, in coming up with the, you know, standardly, we measure things by minority women and emerging, emerging business participation. Um, sometimes people don't like that because you could have a bunch of emerging businesses and like no minority businesses, right? So, so Meyer specifically was like, I want, we want to make sure we measure as our kind of base, the minority and women business participation, because those are the, kind of the harder ones of the, that, that category. And so um, we went, what I would call above and beyond in a bunch of different ways. And one was thinking about how that MWESB participation was at the design level, uh, pushing toward that 47%, you know, is very rigorous in, in the state of Oregon. Um, and then, you know, you can have owners of companies that are, are minority or women owned, um, but the people who are actually working on the job site might might not you know, be, reflect the community, right? That you're building in. And so we put in a diverse workforce participation goal. Uh, I, I, it'd be nice actually if the slide said what our goal was and what we actually met because our goal was 30% for the minority. Um, I think 10% for the women hours on the job site and we far exceeded uh, that diverse workforce participation on the site. So we wanted to make sure we had jobs essentially at all levels um, that were giving opportunity to the people that might not have the opportunity uh, normally to work on a project like this. And um, then we also wanted to do, you know, uh, direct entry employment opportunities for pre-apprenticeship programs. That number we're still tracking. It's, it's a hard number to track because it's, it's about kind of promoting something that may or may not happen in your project. So I would say that's still pending how, how we did on that goal. Um, and then there was the, what we call like stretch, like, okay, we're, we're stretching here and there's some risk associated with stretching and um, how to share that risk was a big discussion. And, and I think we did that successfully, but 80 per, we essentially said we want 80% of the scopes of work. So if you count up the scopes of work, 80% of them were minority or women owned businesses, um, which is different than the number above the 47% number that deals with the amount of dollars that flow to those companies. 80% deals with the actual amount of businesses participating. And then we wanted 20% of those awards given to be what we call stretch opportunities, which essentially says this company is totally qualified to do this job. They've just never done a job of this scale or maybe this type. Maybe they've done residential, but they haven't done commercial. Maybe they've done, it's just not at the scale that they've done. So um, those companies can now have a portfolio that says I've done a project of the scale and then move on to the next part. So it's part of it is about growing companies and it's hard to grow if nobody gives you a chance to do a project that you might not have done before. Uh, and then, you know, stretch went more into how decisions were made, furniture, storytelling. I, I can go on and on about that whole area, but it, equity wasn't just limited to construction, which normally it, it's only thought of uh, in construction. Obviously, we can't do all this work on our own. We're not, none of us are experts in this. So, um, you know, the nonprofit Sustainable Northwest is really critical. Uh, trade organizations and pre-apprenticeship programs uh, were extremely critical, right, in getting the pipeline of, of diverse candidates and uh, money, resources, efforts need to be put toward these organizations so that they can grow, uh, grow um, a new workforce, essentially, or allow a workforce to, to participate that hadn't uh, prior. So I'm going to take you on a tour of the project now that you know about the sustainability and equity goals. Um, the design principles were, uh, and, I, and I won't go through them uh, extensively, but you know, they wanted to be welcoming to the community, designed from the inside out. So really thinking about the users in the building, not just like how the building looked. Um, be equitable with regard to actual, the folks that are, the staff that are working in the building that they have, everybody has equal access to light and windows. And there wasn't um, this kind of hierarchy of, you know, of uh, private meeting rooms in the corner. All of the corners of the building are dedicated to staff spaces. Um, timeless, you know, not to be, um, to be humble, but an elegant, elegant design, sustainability, which we talked a lot about, and then being connected to the landscape um, was, was important. So uh, if you know Portland, I-5, um, this is kind of on the edge. Uh, this is north, 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 northeast Portland. Um, and you got Tillamook, 
uh, middle school here to kind of give you context. Uh, used to be this tow yard, not necessarily a uh, neighborhood's favorite. <laughs> Um, the building was uh, ended up being 19,000, about, about 20,000 square feet, uh, $10.8 million in construction. We had uh, 17 parking stalls and three surface stalls and then 20 uh, bike parking spaces. But you can see uh, the idea of welcoming to the community. You can see that in this open kind of light filled uh, space. Uh, the, there is a convening space on the ground floor, which is called the Center for Great Purposes. And that convening space, um, Center for Great Purposes. Great Purposes was a, a part of uh, Fred Meyer, who was um, kind of the entrepreneur that this foundation's money got got their money from. He wrote in his will about something something about Great Purposes, right? And so they decided to uh, call this the Center for Great Purposes to kind of live up to that aspirational goal of the foundation. Um, you can see the lobby here, and I'll talk more about kind of the art uh, associated with the building, but there's a custom uh, art piece here. And uh, as I mentioned, I'll talk more about art, but uh, Meyer has essentially done a partnership with that middle school that I pointed out. Uh, the King Elementary School and the Tubman Middle School have a program where they introduce you to art and art curation. And so the middle school students essentially curated looked at a bunch of different pieces of artwork from the artist that was the visiting artist that was at the elementary school. So there's visiting artists at the elementary school and the middle school uh, essentially picked out what piece of art would go in the lobby. And so that's gonna be a rotating exhibit where you can imagine the middle school students who are in that curation program walking by this building around the corner and being like, hey, I did that, you know, I picked that out. So having that um, connection to, to community is important. And then this pre-function space, you can see really shallow in depth with the idea that, you know, people can congregate here. You can see in and out. Uh, we created a front porch, I would call it, here on, on purpose. We could have pushed the building all the way out to the edge, but intentionally left it back to create this welcoming environment. And there's some, some words that are um, embedded in the, the, the ground there that talk about um, being welcoming uh, to the community. Uh, you get a sense of that mass plywood. So the mass plywood was in the Center for Great Purposes, but it was also the feature stair, kind of this main stair going up, uh, uh, features the mass plywood. And then we wanted to create elements of, you know, there's some serious topics, right, that are being talked about in these spaces and even in the messaging that we put throughout the building. But we also wanted spaces for joy uh, and reflection. And so we did this um, I call it a kaleidoscope of colors. It's it's a very interesting thing if you're actually to visit. Uh, there's some film on the Center for Great Purposes and depending on what which angle you're at, it completely changes color and by the time of day and uh, it just bringing a sense of wonder and joy uh, to the space. And so this is the Center for Great Purposes, convening space, multi, um, essentially allows you to configure it a bunch of different ways. And, and the idea is that all the stakeholders that Meyer works with, they can have the opportunity to, to come here, collaborate, uh, invent things, all of the organization can be in the space, which they weren't able to do in their prior space. And then there's, a, a, you can see a great connection to this outdoor garden. So this gives you a sense for the toy yard before. And now we have the Kwai Sam Yakwa uh, garden. All of the plants that were in, uh, are in this garden have some sort of uh, either medicinal or cultural or um, food. Um, significance to the, the Native American communities that um, are in Oregon. And so there's some messaging around that, uh, that kind of reference uh, why these plants uh, were chosen. Okay, yeah, sorry, went really fast. This is kind of a view looking above. Um, you can see the solar here. Um, there's a, a, a green roof and a roof deck. Uh, there's actually a fountain here that got put in after this photo um, to kind of bring uh, some some uh, healing, you know, the space to feel like more of a healing space. Um, the space that they were in before, you couldn't, uh, all the staff couldn't meet at one location, uh, or they had all, they were very fragmented with regard to <laughs> where uh, the spaces that they were allowed to occupy in their, their prior building. And so creating this kind of larger lunchroom and outdoor deck uh, was important for the kind of organizational culture. And then um, creating collaborative office spaces, their prior building, they were on all different floors, uh, kind of in silos physically and creating these um, almost like neighborhoods within the building 
uh, where teams can, can, can be. And then a variety of spaces, uh, small conference rooms, large conference rooms, really a, a flexibility, which is gonna be very critical uh, post uh, COVID or during this time period, the ability that you don't have to be just at your desk all day. Like if you're in the office, you can go to a focus room or a small room, you can go outside, <laughs> you can go on the deck uh, is important. So kind of build, building into that uh, resilience idea. And then, you know, as I, I mentioned, the choice of views and locations were really dedicated to staff. So this is the Mission Library. Um, I believe it was named after uh, Mission Coffee that Fred Meyer had. So some relation, there's little little nuggets of information related to um, Fred Meyer, but the, the library is really a, a collection of diversity, equity, and inclusion books and other books related to the mission of Meyer. And the idea is that over time, it also gets filled with a, all the organizations they work with, each one has, this is the book that best explains what we do or, you know, kind of forward thinking and, and this will become a library for, the, for those type of books. And you can see uh, the bridge here in the background, very, very good views. Um, storytelling and art, I was mentioning it's, it's kind of a different project in the sense that <clears throat> Meyer previously in their, in their former building had um, a collection of art that was collected over time. And what I forgot to say was, I think it was maybe like six years ago, or maybe seven with COVID, uh, <laughs> uh, they stopped all of their um, activities at the organization and essentially shut down for a year to rethink about how they were giving and how they were organized as, as, a, as a foundation uh, with the focus on equity. And so um, through that process, they change, you know, the way that they operate. And, and as a result of that, a lot of organizations within um, Oregon also changed kind of to reorient themselves to this new way of thinking. And that was a while ago. Um, now that they were moving to a new building, they, they had the chance to reflect on what will, what's the art we have, right? And they realized that the art did not reflect, you know, there were mostly white males, uh, artists, and they didn't reflect the diversity of Oregon. And so they took this as an opportunity to, uh, hire artists to make custom a custom piece, custom pieces. And so you can see one here in the lobby. Um, you can see one in the lunchroom. And it, actually this is two <laughs> because the fish was, uh, the rainbow trout was um, a piece that was in their former space, uh, either beloved or hated piece, depending on who you talk to. Um, and they decided to merge it with a, a new mural. Um, and what was great about this, is it kind of reflected their history, but also brought in, you know, some new art by a more, more diverse uh, set of artists, and then also connected to their mission with regard to uh, healthy ecosystems in the environment. And then, you know, throughout the project, we basically took these stories of um, a couple different stories. One, the story of sustainability. Another one, the story of Fred Meyer, right, the founder of the foundation. Another one on um, kind of the history of the place um, and, and created, you know, picked art, uh, and did very interesting, like this is out, outside and it talks about the different plants, right? And it has symbols that show what, what the uses are for those uh, various plants to the Native uh, American communities. Uh, the, the bathroom signage, this is just one of, you know, many different languages that are showcases to kind of show the, the languages that are spoken in Oregon. Um, each of the conference rooms is named after a date, a history, a, a date in history, and a story. And each story uh, talks about a different uh, community in Oregon. So the story would be on one side and then kind of a picture on the back side. Um, and then, you know, like I said, in the garden, uh, this oculus that, that talks about um, why, why this, you know, was named after um, kind of we are always here uh, was, was the concept behind um, the garden. And then, you know, even some of the pieces being interchangeable over time, you can see this piece that has these blocks. It has quotes by, uh, you know, Maya Angelou or fa famous people interdispersed with quotes from staff. Um, and the idea is that you can pull these blocks out and interchange them over time. And then art, you know, this, uh, this is America, stolen and plundered land, making you think. When you walk through their space, you, you're going to think differently uh, about where you are, um, whose land it is, um, uh, what, what we want for the world. And so, you know, this is right outside of their, their boardroom and it basically talks about, you know, Fred Meyer's quote and all giving give thought um, and, and kind of uh, remembering kind of the origins uh, of the organization. And so sort of as a summary, as I'm coming up on 40 minutes, um, how do you go about centering equity in a project? Uh, I think first you have to realize that you need to, 
you know, diverse partners that actually value this work. This would be very hard to accomplish if the folks involved in it weren't believers in, <laughs> in the vision, right? So we, first of all, we all wanted to see something like this happen. Uh, then we just sat around and we had to say like, well, what are our goals, right? Because we can't achieve these things if we don't have clear goals. Uh, we knew that we were going to have to stretch our capabilities and increase risk in some way, just because what we're trying to do is um, change the industry in some way. So, so there's, there's something to that. And, and then not limit our equity conversations to just construction. Like we talked about it, how every single aspect, I can't even describe to you <laughs> in, a, in a presentation, what, what went into thinking about, it went down to what furniture do we select? Uh, is it responsive to different people's sizes and different mobility? You know, so focus on uh, ADA, uh, focus on um, different body sizes, being welcoming, literally being welcoming to all people uh, in, in a physical sense, but also in a eventually in, in the giving that they give. Um, and then how decisions were made. Every single staff member at some point was in a committee or, or did something that, you know, so at the end of the day, that building is a true reflection of the organization. And then, you know, periodically Meyer would um, ask for advice from different partners. So they sought, you know, on the naming and, you know, all of the things they sought advice. Uh, and then at the end of the day, we, we weren't checking boxes. I mean, we had goals that we were trying to check, but it wasn't, it was really something that we embodied, we all embodied um, that was super important uh, to us as, as personally, our personal values. And then, you know, for some people, not everybody on the team knows what's going on or it is, you know, we have a lot of team members, right? So we're bringing people along on the journey and, and we're all learning and growing, right? We, none of us are the experts in this. And so with that, I, I wanted to conclude this presentation. I know uh, I didn't really talk about larger issues, which I think Rob might allude to, but I, I encourage everybody to go to this website, uh, partly because there's a video on there that goes through uh, the history of Oregon and kind of the context of this project within that, um, that I think you'd appreciate. And, and any of you in the development or, or design or any of those fields, um, because this project is so rich <laughs> with information, uh, we actually created one pagers for each topic that I talked about. So one pager on the art, one pager, pager on the sustainable wood story. Um, so if you wanna dig deeper, that, that could be helpful. And thank you. Look forward to questions. Thank you, Anule, thank you so much. It's such a, inspiring project. Why don't we hop off to share share the screen so uh, we can get into dialogue. Um, it's such a powerful project on many levels, um, which you sort of touched on, you know, very quickly, given you only had 40 minutes, but I want to start with sort of uh, the, the obvious, which is this twinning of equity and sustainability. And I think a lot of um, you know, I came up through sustainability. So I came up through sort of the green building movement early in my career. And when I launched Eco Districts, we were making an intentional commitment that equity and, and sustainability are fundamentally, you know, uh, you know, the kind of cornerstones of community-based development. And I think this project really reflects that. So I'm, I'm curious because you've also been working in the intersections of equitable and sustainable development. What are some of the lessons learned as you've put these two agendas together on a project? And then talk a bit about the context of that in the neighborhood that this project sits. And is it inspiring new conversations or new activities um, uh, that are, you know, again, really kind of ensuring that sustainability and equity kind of continue um, to be the sort of drivers of, of real estate and, and placemaking and community development? A long question. <laughs> right. I, um, sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. You might have to ask part of it again. Um, <laughs> I think there's a bunch of us that care about equity and, and maybe we've always cared about it, right? But our industries haven't given us a forum or context in which to prioritize it. And I mean, you have equity considerations at publicly funded projects, you know, kind of these mandates, you gotta, you know, do that. Um, but in the market rate world, you would have to impose that right on a project and being a market rate developer and knowing the risks <laughs> involved in development and you know um, the ability to kind of layer on additional potential risks that most people don't in development don't want to do that right we had that whole movement of sustainability where folks said our climate is changing we're contributing 40 percent to this <laughs> change we have to do something so there was sort of a, a belief 
you know, an indoctrination, whatever you want to call it, into that movement. Um, we haven't up till now had the ability to prioritize, you know, there hasn't been folks out there saying, no, we need to prioritize this too. And I think that's the sad part about, you know, the sustainability when I learned it in the 90s was a three legged stool. And you got the economic, you got the social, and you got the <laughs> environmental. And everybody went for the environmental, right? Because it's like slightly more feel good, let's say. Uh, everybody's going to do the economic because it's part of a project, a development project. Uh, and then everybody kind of looked at the social, like, what do, how do we measure that? What do we do? <laughs> Um, we have to be as rigorous with the equity part in developing tools and metrics and rating systems and whatever, as we have been with sustainability is my thought. Um, what was great about this project was the beginning of thinking about that. So I had started thinking about it when I was working um, on this nonprofit called the Soul District in Portland, and we were coming up with a checklist uh, with literally thinking about social sustainability, like if a developer came in, let's say to the black community and you want it to be like, is this project good or bad? Could we come up with a checklist that said, if you meet X amount on this checklist, this project is deemed as a benefit, let's say to, to the community. Um, I didn't, you know, it was kind of my part-time, I did a little bit of it. Uh, what this project allowed me to do is to go deep on the development side of it, right? Um, doing work at the policy level, housing equity policy level at the state, which is kind of like way, you know, far away from the, it's not going to be far away from the ground soon, but, you know, right now it's kind of far from the ground. Um, we need more of that kind of knowledge center, you know, sort everyone, you know, you <laughs> thinking about that kind of middle size scale, the kind of urban design scale and how we can take these kind of values and every project's not going to have all of this right in it. Um, but we have to do something different on each project, right? And then it becomes easier, just like the sustainability movement. It's like, people are like, oh, whatever, lead now. You know, <laughs> I do lead in my sleep. Um, we need to feel that we're, you know, and then you'll have the people always on the front edge who are pushing that and then everybody else can make it, can make it easier uh, for each person after that. And so why, you know, why is that important to this project in this context is we have a historic African-American community like we do in most major American cities that had, you know, major public infrastructures come and destroy it like we do in most American cities. And we still don't have a lot of solutions to look to, to say, how do we, um, com how do we allow the folks that were in a community if, if they haven't been displaced yet to benefit from improvements that happen in their neighborhoods and uh, have, the, have the choice to stay, right? Or to move to another community if that's their choice. Um, we're, I feel like there's a lot of people talking about what are those tools, what are those financing mechanisms, what are those policies? Um, and this is just an example on a specific one development project is like, how can you make a difference in this area? Um, and it extends farther than, sorry, the actual development, it extends to how Meyer's gonna operate the building, what vendors are they gonna bring in, who's gonna be their caterers for their events, et cetera, et cetera. So procurement. Uh, yeah, that and that's very helpful. I think your point about, you know, we, we institutionalize sustainability to a certain extent, and you're seeing now sort of equitable development and the kind of very key kind of performance metrics around that now becoming part of the work. And I think Myers, you know, helping push that agenda even further, like, like so many foundations, of course, the foundation has a really interesting history and the leadership of Michelle DePass and Kai Adams, who are, you know, giants in the field and really, are, I think, are reorienting the sort of philanthropic sector in Oregon in a really yes. important way around equity is, is huge. A, a very specific question is my is the Meyer building uh, from from Abby Dacey is the Meyer building part of an eco district? And if not, how might it inspire one? So it's a bit of the second question. How does yeah. this project sit in? you know, the broader neighborhood sustainable and equitable development right. agenda. Well, it's sort of on the edge, the edge of a highway, right? And there are plans, uh, at least the black community is pushing that there, this highway gets capped at around this location, right? And that we knit back, we restore uh, in a sense, a little bit of a restorative justice sense, uh, but phys a physical form of that would be putting a cap and, and, and investing money actually into that cap, not just making some kind of concrete lid where we can uh, nip back the community that was there. But then also, you know, so for th those that don't know, south of this, south of the highway um, is an al the Albina Vision Plan. Um, and the, the folks that are really 
uh, pushing that forward is the idea that we had this thriving African-American community that was completely removed, you, you know, decimated uh, by the city forces, by the regional forces, um, many of which are still there, right? And, and that wealth that was created there was completely taken. And uh, that Albina vision wants to, to bring back uh, a new community, right? that has all of these values that we've been talking about on the specific project, but more on a, like I say, an eco-district level, um, uh, that it becomes a mixed income communities that, you know, has affordable home ownership uh, that allows the folks pushed out through gentrification and displacement to, to come back, to have a homecoming. And we can't um, erase the past, nor, nor should we forget the past. Uh, and there's a lot of pain associated with that, but, but there are things, very concrete things that we can do um, moving forward that that respond uh, to that history, rather than doing kind of this the same same thing. So, for an example, the highway is supposed to be widening. That sounds very similar to the highway coming through, <laughs> and so without thinking of uh, the past historical injustices, and uh, we're just repeating essentially the past. Thank you. Um... There's some questions about the storytelling and art and sort of the thoughtfulness of that. I, I see in your bio, you've written on sort of cultural landscape, you're a landscape architect by training. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about that because, um, you know, there's this, there's a sort of, you know, this critique of our work in urban design and development about place taking, you know, you know, place making, but really it's about place taking. It seems like Myers and this project's done a really nice job of trying to honor uh, a variety of stories, some of them conflicting, um, but, but really important to tell. Um, how did that become such a part of the project? Um, and was it just part of the sort of budget from the beginning? Uh, hmm. Did it come in? It's a good question. Um, so it's funny that you brought that up. Sometimes I forget <laughs> about myself. I actually, my master's thesis was on how do you tell stories through landscape? That was my master's thesis. <laughs> so when that, when that part, I remind you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like, Hey, um, so when that part came out, uh, I was like, Oh my gosh, my master's thesis, you know, let me, let me work on this. It's funny because it's the part I was actually least involved with, um, which is just a funny thing. Uh, I, all, I knew it was going to be the hardest part. Like when people say like, what are you most proud of? I'm like that part, because telling stories with the right language and what are you going to say? And how are you going to say it? And how's it going to look is, is extremely hard. I mean, I think it's easier to do the buildings, frankly. Um, and so the part that I was heavily involved in really was the RFP, like what are the stories we're going to tell? So that was the hardest part, you know, setting that stage. Uh, what was great is we had an amazing, um, company, Ditroen was the name of the company, who could take these stories and then put them into like physical form. Um, and so, like I said, each part of the project had uh, all these subcommittees involved with it, and that part did too. So there were folks within Meyer who were talking about how does it get told, you know. So I think at the end of the day, we just spent a lot of time thinking about it. And, and I think if you know Meyer, you know that they would spend a lot of time thinking about it. Um, it I, I think it might have had a budget at the beginning, but we didn't really know what it is that we were going to do. Um, and I think we, I think we actually decided to add more to that budget. Um, like for example, from the development perspective, we didn't know about the art at the beginning. We knew we were going to do something branding wise. We we kind of didn't know if they were going to take their old art, if they're going to get new art. And um, so I think a lot of these things can evolve. You don't have to figure them all out at the beginning. Um, it's just we knew that you can't go through all this process and build a building and then just put up the old art considering what it was, you know. So once you get into all this, you start realizing some things that need to change. So I, we only have a few more minutes, but I, I want to finish with a little bit of where you're at now in your company and what you're trying to accomplish. Um, Cause it's a big shift. You're on your, you know, you're, you're moving out on your own and with a really specific focus on creating wealth for the black community and other unrepresented people who have not benefited from real estate. And this is a neighborhood that, you know, just, which is one of the most impacted displaced black communities in the country per capita. Um, so talk a little bit about that. What, what are you doing? What are you learning? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I think what I learned through the Meyer project was you can't do something unless you make it a goal. <laughs> you, you have to put it out there. This is what I want to do. This is, you know, and then what's important to this type of work is really partners at the end of the day. Um, people who are 
on the same path and vision and passions and then they see yours and then you figure out how to do it together so uh that's one of the reasons i went out really bold with what i wanted to do because i was like if i don't do that i'm never gonna know what's possible um i had tried to do an affordable home ownership uh piece of a uh, of a, a townhouse project that i did uh i was on the board of the portland housing center and we were trying to say how can we encourage developers to do affordable home ownership specifically for the bipoc community so I, I said, let me let me try that out on my project as long as I can, and I'll come back with a report. And I basically ran into all the obstacles you can run into and realize this is why it's not happening. And I sort of put that on the back shelf because I didn't really have time. It's to you have to, you know, you have to figure out new pathways, new partners, new everything, right? To figure these things that don't work. Um, I decided one of the reasons I decided to start my own company is to give me the time and 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 the focus to to try new things. And so um, I want to. I do want to focus on affordable home ownership. I understand that the funding is not there because uh, if it was there, you would see it all over the place. <laughs> and so part of it's going to deal with advocacy, right? And I think the federal government right now is thinking about this because I've I've heard from folks saying that this is high on the radar. I know the state's thinking about it. I know the city wants it, but more importantly, I know the community, especially the Black community, wants home ownership um, opportunities because really, at the end of the day, um, that's where wealth. Uh, for most of, uh, you know, middle class America is created through uh, real estate ownership in their home. Uh, and so if we don't have a way for people to get into that, um, it, it dictates a lot of their future economic uh, power in a community. Uh, so I'm interested in that. I'm also interested in um, doing uh, similar work to Meyer, essentially values oriented um, uh, projects for mission 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 based work. And so I'm talking to uh, another foundation actually um, that deals with the black uh, that centers on the black community and youth um, to think about how to do something innovative. So I, I want to take my market rate approach development skills and 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 help and think about how organizations and our communities can can kind of operate in that same space. So I'm not trying to be a like a consultant or um, do as much fee-based work, but really uh, do market-based mission work. And there really isn't uh, a lot of uh, precedence <laughs> for that. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see how that, that happens. I'm excited, I'm excited about that. Well, I'm excited and, and applaud you for that and, and um, look forward to, to hearing how it goes. I wanted to you know, finish by thanking you for this work, thanking you for the work that you do. If you've been to Portland, um, you know some of the some of the most you know kind of impact projects both from a design and i think a development um Anulay's had her fingers on a lot of them and so for someone who's been at it for less than 20 years that's um that's a great contribution and, and your contribution civically as well um mm -hmm. are really important and i think for all of us who are grappling with this work about how to integrate equity and sustainability into projects and, and particularly on the neighborhood scale you know, projects like Meyer are important because they're kind of like acupuncture points. There, there are opportunities for a deep investment in a project that hopefully has ripple effects. And I think that question about how does Meyer or your work going forward really inform or the broader uh, needs of a community are, are important. And um, that's one reason I launched Eco Districts was to try to um, you know to try to press into the industry a need for performative. Mm -hmm. uh, neighborhood scale development. I think your equity lens turning into equity performance metrics that were finer grain is exactly the kind of uh, work that, have, that our uh, eco district projects are pursuing. Um, so for any of you on the call, you know, as always, we always encourage you to become an eco district AP to learn about the protocol. We encourage projects to pursue eco um, uh, certified as a framework to, to provide transparent reporting around governance. In partnership and on on the kind of um, sustainability for equity performance we heard about uh, from Anile and, and her project. So, thanks again. Again, this is going to be recorded for those of you whose questions we didn't get to. Feel free to tap tab in. We'll try to uh, make sure we get around to, and we could even get back to Anile for maybe following up on some of the questions that we didn't get to. But appreciate everybody's time, um, and look forward to uh, seeing you again, Anile. Good luck with your with your next uh, next chapter in the work and uh, talk to everyone again at our next uh, webinar, which is gonna be in September. We're gonna take July and August off 
Um, let's get outside and enjoy each other's company for a couple months. <laughs> let's let's get back to working in person and, and we'll see you online again in the fall. Um, and we'll have some exciting announcements, including a new equity, um, race equity training uh, uh, a module for our AP program, which we'll be launching in the next month. So look forward to seeing you all uh, soon. And thanks again, Anjali. Thank you for having me. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye.